In this episode of Machining and Microwaves, I'll explain in detail how the great seal bug worked and show you the design of the replicas I made. There'll also be a bit of and even some as a sneak preview of how I machined the replicas. As I explained in an earlier episode, the famous bug was found in the US Ambassador's residence in Moscow in 1952. It had been eavesdropping on the top secret conversations in his study since the spring of 1945. The bug has no battery, no power supply and no active components. Let's have a look at what the bug looks like. There's a cylindrical metal body a little under an inch in diameter and three quarters of an inch long, with a thin round rod sticking out of the side. The thread has a threaded end and fits through a plastic bush with an internal thread. The rod's 2mm diameter and the thread's a 0.4mm pitch. In Imperial that's about 64 teeth per banana. On one end there's a grill with 8 pierced holes around a central round hole. On the other end there's a plain cap. Under the grill there's a thin metal membrane fixed to a threaded bronze ring. Inside the cylinder there's a part with a central post. It's formed into a wide threaded rim at one end and a small flat grooved disc at the other. The threaded rim fits into an internally threaded section inside the cylindrical body. The post 2mm diameter and the disc is 6mm across. The internal thread's an M20 by 0.5, so about 50 TPI. Apart from the plastic bush and a flat-ended metal disc on the inside of that long 2mm rod, that's all there is. No active parts, no wires, no trickery of any sort. To an untrained eye, how on earth could that be a bugging device? Have you ever seen the demonstration where a singer belts out a loud high note towards a crystal wine glass? If the note's exactly correct, the glass vibrates very strongly as it absorbs energy from the vibrations created in the air by the singer's voice. It can even shatter if the singer's loud and exactly in tune. That's a mechanical vibration. The exact note where the sympathetic vibrations are the maximum depends on the density of the glass, its dimensions and its stiffness. How sharp the resonance is and how long the glass continues to resonate depend on the material the glass is made from. Individual atoms in the glass don't move much, but the bulk effect of all those tiny movements at atomic level combine together and the result's quite a loud ringing at resonance. Now, if you take a thin metal rod hanging from a fine insulated thread and expose it to a radio wave at just the right frequency, it'll pick up energy from the electromagnetic field of the wave. There isn't any need for air to be there, it's not a mechanical vibration, it's electric and magnetic fields changing intensity very fast. The rod intercepts those fields in a similar way to how the wine glass intercepts the sound waves. So instead of a physical vibration, electrical currents start to flow in sympathy as the electrons in the rod are pushed around by the changing field. They don't move far, same as the atoms in the glass don't move much. As the electrons start to move, they generate a magnetic field. Now, the combination of changing electric and magnetic field in the rod means it behaves just like a radio transmitting aerial, and it'll radiate energy. But wait, where did that energy come from? Well, it was supplied by the incoming electromagnetic field. So. Surely they cancel out. What actually happens is that the two fields are superimposed, but they don't cancel. There might be cancellation at some specific points, but let's imagine you send a radio beam up a narrow street of tall houses. You suspend your aerial rod vertically in the centre of a crossroad junction. The rod gets immersed in the electromagnetic field of the radio beam. Those houses are made of material that soaks up radio energy, which is why I can never get a cell phone signal inside my house, which is made from damp bricks held together with custard. Creme anglaise for those living in civilised parts of the world. The rod absorbs energy from the electromagnetic field and generates its own field as a result. The rest of the radio wave energy disappears straight on from the junction and eventually... Oh, wait. If there are any flat earthers or in these political correct times, perhaps I should say terrestrial globularity deniers watching, please cover your ears. Eventually it dissipates or it goes into deep space as it carries on while the curvature of the earth drops away. Okay, uncover your ears, flurfers. Uh, hello? Now let's see what happens if the rod isn't there. There's still a bit of diffraction at the junction and a little of the incident radio signal leaks around the corner into the side street, but it's significantly less and there's some deep nulls with no signal. Comparing the steady state fields with and without the rod shows clearly that the rod's making a significant contribution to the signal down the side street as we'd expect. 
Now, think about what happens if we set up a radio receiver down the road that crosses at the junction. It can't see the signal from the transmitter, but it can see the rod, and it can receive some of the energy that the rod re-emitted. OK, OK, in the real world you'd get some reflections and some direct signal, but if nothing in town's moving, all the reflections and direct leakage will superimpose. They might look like this on a graph of power against time. All different amplitudes and phases. By some trigonometric magic, a combination of sine waves with the same frequency but different amplitudes and phases will combine into a single signal. I have a wonderful mathematical proof of that, but this margin's too narrow to contain it. The phase of that combined signal will be fixed so long as nobody moves anything. So, if you collect some of it on a separate antenna and adjust the delay and the amount of signal, you could cancel out most of the direct signal you see on the main receive antenna. It's a similar idea to the way noise cancelling headphones work, except they do all the maths and fiddling for you. In a perfect world with the transmitter hidden from the receiver but the rod visible to both, you can adjust your receiver to hear mostly the retransmitted signal. Not much use so far, but imagine for a moment that you could stretch and compress the rod so the resonant frequency can be moved up and down a little. As you change the length of the rod, the amount of energy it harvests from the radio wave changes as does the resulting re-radiation. Now, if you could change the length of the rod thousands of times a second, you could use it to apply audio modulation to the retransmitted signal. There's a problem with a simple straight rod though. It's not sharply resonant. Unlike a wine glass, it resonates poorly over several percent of its central peak. Part of that's because it re-radiates the energy it receives very effectively, assuming there are no other losses. In reality, all practical materials do have a bit of loss, but it's negligible for a copper or silver rod in free space. To make a really sharp and efficient resonator, we'll have to move to a different arrangement. If you've got a short cylinder blanked off at one end and you fix a thin rod to the end plate, you can make a resonator that doesn't radiate its energy away. If you shorten the cylinder and rod, it'll resonate at a much higher frequency. One way to move the resonance back down is to fit a disc to the free end of the rod and fit a plate over the open end of the cylinder. The small gap between the disc and the plate can store electric charge and then release it. It does that by concentrating the electric field much more tightly than where the rod's just sitting in the open end of the tube. The effect's called capacitance. Capacitors are used in almost all electronic equipment, but they usually have tiny gaps and large surface areas. Often they're made from foil sheets folded or rolled up with insulating material between them to concentrate the field even more. Using a shortish cylinder and rod and adjusting the gap to be really tiny, that extra capacitance can pull the resonance down to a fraction of what it would otherwise be. Shortening the cylinder also reduces conduction losses and as a result, the cavity can have an extremely narrow resonance bandwidth, hundreds of times sharper than the rod in free space. Sadly, a closed cavity is no use to anyone. We need a way to get some electromagnetic wave energy inside the resonator so it can resonate. So, how about we drill a hole in the side and poke our suspended rod into the cavity so the rod ends fairly close to the central post? A bit of the electric field from the free end of the rod will couple with the post, but it won't be a very strong coupling. So, let's put a flat disc on the end of the rod to increase the area between it and the post. Now, more of the energy in the rod can couple into the cavity. The energy swills back and forth like water in a bathtub, making larger and larger waves. But of course, the energy is also coupled back to the rod and excites a larger oscillation in it. And as before, most of the energy that's coupled into the cavity resonators re-radiated from the rod. However, the effect of coupling the rod to the cavity means that the sharpness of the resonance in the rods increased enormously, while that of the cavities flattened out a bit. If you change the gap between the post and the disc on the end of the rod, the amount of coupling can be adjusted. Now, unfortunately, that also changes the tuning of the cavity and the rod. So getting the gap, the length of the rod, and the gap at the free end of the post all adjusted is hugely fiddly. Six hours and five copies it took me the first time I tried. So far, we still don't have anything useful. We need to find a way to adjust the resonance using a sound wave vibrating something like in a microphone. Spookily enough, there's a type of microphone which uses a stretched conductive foil spaced a tiny distance from a plate with a cavity behind it.
As sound waves hit the foil, it vibrates back and forth in sympathy with the air molecules. It's known as a condenser microphone. Condenser is an old name for a capacitor. How convenient! Remember we've got a capacitor formed by the gap between the top of the post and the plate at the open end of the cavity. Well, what would happen if we remove the plate and stretch a very thin foil across the end instead? Assuming we stay very, very quiet and the foil's a good conductor at 1000 MHz like the plate was, nothing will change. The Q factor will be the same, the resonance will be the same, the re-radiated signal will be the same. Now if the foil moves a little towards the disc on the resonator post, that increases the value of the capacitance at the end of the cavity. The resonant frequency falls a little because of physics. If the foil moves away from the disc, the resonant frequency rises a little. Imagine we ask our opera diva to sing a note at the unfortunate wine glass a tiny fraction of a semitone too high. The glass won't resonate as much as when they're on the correct note. If they move the note up a tiny bit more, the amount that the glass resonates will be even less. Conversely, if they change their strident yelling down to a slightly lower note, the glass will vibrate like bilio. Interesting. Let's tune our bug to exactly a thousand megahertz and check the response over a few hundred kilohertz either side. It looks like the Q factor is about a thousand with about one megahertz bandwidth at the half power points. Apply a steady radio signal at a thousand megahertz and check we're at the peak. Now let's tune the bug 300 kilohertz down in frequency to 999.7 megahertz. The amplitude's about half what it was at the peak frequency. When a sound wave arrives and increases the pressure on the diaphragm above average, it pushes it towards the disc on the resonator post. That reduces the resonant frequency down to perhaps 999.6 MHz, and the amplitude of the oscillation falls a little more as we slide further down the slope of that resonance curve. A thousandth of a second later, though, the air pressures drop below average, and the resonance shifts up to maybe 999.8 MHz, so the amplitude of the resonance increases. That variation in the amplitude of the resonance varies with the sound waves arriving at the foil. The re-radiated energy also varies in the same proportion. The effect of the variations means that re-radiated signal has the audio signal impressed on it as a few percent of amplitude modulation. Just like a really terrible sound engineer might produce on a broadcast AM radio station. You know, the type we have here that plays both types of music, country and western. The re-radiated signal also carries some phase modulations. For hugely complicated mathematical reasons, that's a good thing. Now, instead of a town with a crossroads, let's install our transmitting equipment in a building over the road from the ambassador's residence at 10 Spazopeskovskaya Square in Moscow, and the receive equipment in a different building off to the side. We'll arrange for some washing to be hung out on the balconies regularly and make the place look as normal as possible. The transmitter setup isn't documented, but it should have been simple enough. Just a plain continuous carry at around 1 GHz with nothing clever apart from good frequency stability, a stable power supply, and careful control over amplitude and phase noise. In 1945, in Moscow, during a long and hard war. It could have been an injection-locked klystron, or perhaps a UHF tube above its normal limits. I don't see a suitable vacuum tube in any of the lists of parts made by Svetlana or the other makers in Russia, so I'll have to defer to those with more knowledge of thermionic device history in 1940s Russia to fill in the details. The receiver was probably a homodyne. If they picked up a sample of the illuminating signal from a sensing antenna, as I described before, it could certainly be used as a coherent local oscillator and mixed in with the received signal, tweaked a lot in phase and amplitude to get the best audio response. I guess they'd have a cabled intercom to the transmitter site for talkback liaison, or perhaps a telephone, to get the transmit frequency and antenna align alignment optimised, as well as fiddling with the receiver settings and antenna setup. It's certainly possible to use a modern AM receiver, but local oscillator phase noise and frequency stability would have been big issues back in the 1940s. The homodyne might lack sensitivity, but you just need to make up for that by using a bit more power at the transmit site or higher gain antennas. Helicals and Yagi Uda antennas were certainly known at the time. In a homodyne, the mixer diode operates in its square law region of forward conduction, performing a multiplication of the wanted signal and the unmodulated carrier. 
that results in some components at the original audio frequency being produced by the diode. You need to pass the mixer output through a diplexer and low-pass filter to extract the audio signals that carries useful voice traffic, perhaps from 200 to 3000 hertz. You also need infinite patience to adjust all the different parameters as they change with humidity, temperature, people moving in the room, foliage moving in the wind, noises from pipe work and all sorts of other metal objects. Right, that's a very simplified but reasonably accurate description of what's going on in the Great Seal Bug system. If you're still with me, take a deep breath and give yourself a pat on the back. Now, a proper YouTuber would give you a zen moment with an ASMR ambient soundscape and floaty pastel images of wildflower meadows and nectar tipsy bees. However, it's still March here in Yorkshire, the wildflower meadow's muddy, it's raining and blowing a hoolie out there, so I'll give you a mugshot of one of my chihuahuas instead. She's a very nice chihuahua, but I understand completely if your meridian response isn't being very autonomously sensory right now. As a quick teaser for the upcoming machining and metrology episode, here's a bit of calming lathe work, making one of the end covers. I made up some precise gauge pins to get the fit absolutely perfect. The original findings from the Naval Laboratory and FBI led to the conclusion that heavy press tooling was used to form the end covers. Any half-decent clockmaker or machinist would have been able to turn them, but as we don't have the originals, we aren't going to find out. As I mentioned, the thickness of the original membrane was reported variously as anything from 7 to 75 micrometers. Now at 1 gigahertz, the skin depth where RF currents in silver drop to 1 over E or around 37% is 2 micrometers. Nickel's a terrible conductor of RF as it's ferromagnetic. The RF field lines are forced even closer to the surface than they would be in silver and the bulk resistivity is also considerably higher. So the skin depth is tiny and the RF resistance losses are huge. To get best performance, around six skin depths of highly conductive plating is needed. At six skin depths, the current's reduced by a factor of 0.37 to the power six, about 0.2% of that at the surface. 
That rather indicated that the silver layer would need to be around 10 micrometers, so a thicker nickel foil would appear to make sense, but it's less than ideal from an acoustic and mechanical perspective. I decided to go with a 10 micrometer copper foil, stretching it radially to work harden it on a special jig. See links in the description to the membrane stretcher videos. I found that the best results were around 950 megahertz, but because of licensing restrictions for transmissions in the UK, I had to do the demonstration at 1.3 gigahertz. That meant making a slightly shorter model for the demo to maintain the same performance. The external antenna rods supported in a threaded polystyrene insulating bush. That keeps it rigid as well as being a good dielectric insulator. There are some interesting questions about how the material was sourced. I haven't got any definite verification of this, but I suspect it may have come from IG Farben, who, amongst other things, made Zyklon B. They were involved in technology transfers to the Russian state during the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact that ended on 22nd of June 1941 at the start of the Great Patriotic War. The material I used was from a donation by a subscriber. Thanks, Pete. It dates from the early 1960s, but should have identical properties to the original. I made the first bodies out of brass rather than copper because I wanted to check how tricky the machining would be. The threads are 0.5mm pitch and proved to be very straightforward to cut in brass. The bug I used for the live demonstration was made from horrible gummy C101 copper, which is a little more challenging to machine. The original was polished internally and silver plated. I reasoned that the performance would be almost as good with no plating, but that it would degrade over time. So for the purposes of the demo, I didn't bother plating the bodies or resonators. You could argue that a silver plated surface would allow a better electrical connection between the resonator thread and the body, as compared with bare copper. But in reality, there's a large capacitance between the two parts across the threads and the impedance is very low as a result, whether or not there's a good DC contact. I would imagine that in the original, the plating was made such that it gave a good tight fit and with silver being relatively soft and slightly self lubricating like gold, it would probably have made rather a good running fit with zero clearance. The half millimetre bleed hole from front to back made perfectly good sense because if you slam a door in the room where the bug's installed, you don't want that sudden pressure wave to overwhelm the diaphragm and short it out. I used a tiny long series drill to make the hole, but they probably used a spade bit. Perhaps one day I'll make a 0.5 millimetre spade bit to try. The long narrow hole effectively creates a sort of mechanical audio high pass filter, so the response below a few hertz would be severely reduced and a sudden surge wouldn't be able to compress the diaphragm very far, unless it was very, very sharp and instantaneous. Closing a door doesn't usually create a huge overpressure anyway. Tests have been done to measure the overpressure from doors closing and there are components up only as far as a few hertz in a large furnished room like the study at Spasso House. So, let's think about the movement of the diaphragm. With our 1 kHz signal at 40 dB sound pressure level, the air molecules are moving back and forth with about 10 nanometers of peak amplitude. The capacitance between the resonator and the diaphragm varies according to the reciprocal of the spacing. With a 25 micrometer gap, that's about 1 thou or 1 mil, and a 6 millimeter diameter post, the capacitance is epsilon naught times the area over the spacing. That's only approximately true where the discs are the same size. With a small disc near a large membrane, the analytic solution is much more complex because of asymmetric equipotential lines, although given how rough your measurements usually end up, it'll probably do. She's not wrong. However, as I'd removed almost half of the surface to a depth of half a millimeter, the results probably close to seven picofarads, including some fringing effects. 
The CIA report from 1955 included some measurements carried out on a copy of the bug. They sliced the body in half and fitted a polystyrene insulating ring into the annular gap and then readjusted the resonator for the same 1 mm or 25 micrometer spacing from the diaphragm. They used a Boonton 160AQ meter at a frequency way below residence, I think they're rated to 75 megahertz, and measured the capacitance of 10 picofarads, although, of course, they called them micro microfarads. It's not clear whether they zeroed out the capacitance of the new gap when setting up the Q meter. If the polystyrene was a sixteenth of an inch thick, say 1.6 millimeters, the capacitance would be at epsilon naught times the relative permittivity of polystyrene, which is about 2.6, times the surface area of the cut face, divided by the thickness of the ring. That's about 2.2 picofarads, and rather suggests that their measurement could indeed include the strays from that gap. I'd have removed the diaphragm and zeroed the bridge so the measurement only included the membrane to resonator capacitance, but it isn't clear whether that's what they did. I'd have recorded my methods too to remove any ambiguity. Sorry, that's professional Neil inside my head getting all fired up about techies and their terrible documentation skills. Deep breath, Neil. <sighs> Needless to say, in a future video, I'll be slicing one of my replicas in half and testing the capacitance using a modern vector network analyzer. Hey, if you subscribed and enabled notifications, you'd be the first to find out when that's published. Of course, if you really want to get on the inside track of what I'm working on, you could consider joining my Patreon page and receiving the twice monthly newsletter and some previews and outtakes or get access to my private Discord discussion server to help me with ideas on which projects to do next. The link's in the description and on a card at the top right of the screen. You can view those cards at any time during the video. Right, now we know the capacitance of the resonator to the membrane, how do we find the resonant frequency? Well, any tuned circuit has a resonant frequency inversely proportional to the square root of the capacitance times the inductance. The exact equation's on the screen. There is an analytic solution to find the inductance of a thin rod in a round coaxial cavity, so we could start with that to get a ballpark figure for the inductance. We'd need to take into account the change in diameter of the rod and the end effects, but it's a good starting point. If you've got a coaxial line of length A with a central rod with an outside diameter of little d in a tube with an internal diameter of big D, the inductance is just mu naught times the length over 2 pi times the natural log of the ratio of big D to little d. The CIA report shows this incorrectly, by the way. Their equation would show a negative inductance, which is a wild concept that makes my brain rattle. Plugging in the values with a length of 15.5 millimetres and a resonator shaft diameter of 2.2 millimetres and the body ID of 19.53 millimetres, the inductance works out at 2.9 nanohenries. Taking the end effects and strays into account, it's probably more like 2.5 nanohenries. Putting that value into the equation for the resonant frequency with 10 picofarad capacitance suggests 1006 megahertz as the result, plus or minus a lot for the fiddle factors. My original tests seem to perform best at 960 megahertz, which is spectacularly close to the calculated values, but it certainly wasn't by design. I was still influenced by all the disinformation I'd read, so I had no idea. Still, like a good engineer, I recorded my findings, even if I thought they were wronger than the wrong thing. Now the CIA lab did some careful checks to see how the resonance changed with the spacing of the diaphragm. They marked 64 divisions around the back face of the resonator and put a fixed mark on the body. Then they tweaked the resonator in tiny steps of a quarter of a division, always in the same direction to remove any backlash. That's 256 steps per rotation. The original and my replicas have half millimetre thread pitch, which is 50.8 threads per inch, but the model they were using had a 48 TPI thread, which is reasonably close. Each quarter division represented a resonator spacing change of about 80 micro inches. Their graph shows the variation of response to a fixed signal versus spacing. I marked out 60 increments on one of my resonators using a rotary table. One of my ticks represents 8.3 micrometers of resonator gap change. So with it resonated at 960 megahertz, it was at three ticks from the contact point. 
I used a nano VNA and a pickup loop to look for movement of the dip at resonance and half a division of rotation moved it from 960 to 1030 megahertz. Sort of roughly 70 megahertz from a 4.16 micrometer change. So 17 megahertz per micrometer as a measured result. Assuming the space is 25 micrometers, the capacitance changes by a factor of 26 over 25 or 4% for that one micrometer move. As the resonant frequency is inversely proportional to the square root of the capacitance, it'll change by about 2% or 19.6 megahertz. I think that's good enough, uh, given the huge uncertainties and approximations involved. The resonance varied with temperature and I had to use some thread lock to keep it completely stable against physical movement. I imagine the NKVD team would have to get used to varying frequency with temperature and humidity changes, but with a telephone link between the transmitter and the receiver, it would have been simple enough to tweak things for maximum performance at the start of each session. If the story about the caretaker's empty room's true, then perhaps he would note when someone was in the study and inform the operations team that it was time to fire up Zlatoust. I'll try to include the fine detail of my measurement setup in a future video on this channel, or perhaps I'll simply upload the raw footage and commentary on my second channel, Machining and Microwaves Plus. The link's in the description, as proper YouTubers would say. Thanks for watching and thanks to my excellent Patreon supporters for helping me to make more videos. Next in this series will be the Great Sealbug Machining and Metrology episode, which will be up there.